And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Basic Action Games, previously the creator of Bash, as well as Honor and Intrigue, which is going to be relevant today with the upcoming Tome of Intriguing Options, the one and only Chris Rutkowski. How are you doing today, man? Hi. Good. Good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming all the way to my temple and, in, and enduring time zone hell. Uh, not a problem. We're actually in the same time zone, I believe. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I have I have a long-standing hatred of time zones from doing this over the last five years. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But I suppose the I suppose the tradition would dictate that I open with the humble beginnings. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Okay. So. For me, really, I remember um, when I was in sixth grade, my school was right by the public library. My mother worked at the um, city hall, which is right next to the public library. So every day after school, I was to walk to the library and wait until like five o'clock for my mom to come and pick me up. And so in the young, the, the, the youth section of the library, they had a bunch of like choose your own adventure books and stuff and I, I used to read those when I was in elementary school and like on the same rack they had the Dungeons and Dragons endless quest books. I really enjoyed reading through that and I, I found out the library has the actual D&D &D books too like they have a whole they had a whole mess of first and second edition D&D &D books and so I started reading those and I didn't really understand what I was reading Right, like I didn't understand like the mechanics of. I was mostly looking at the monster manuals before I was reading the actual rule books, so I didn't know understand what AC even stood for and stuff. But I was just fascinated by these books, and was like, okay, I want to play these games. And so I ended up getting uh, the Dungeons and Dragons black box set for Christmas that year, um, and that was my first real introduction to actual RPGs. Was reading through the the box set that was made for kids, right? So I was actually able to understand it a lot better than just reading through random first ed books in no particular order <laughs> or, or understanding what I was actually doing. Um, and so that was my first real introduction to RPGs uh, was that. I, I think when I was in the same grade, maybe seventh, I also... There were these collectible card games of Marvel. No, not even card games. They were just collectible cards of Marvel superheroes. And the backs had, like, stats, right? Like, each character had, like, a stat ranked from 1 to 7 of, like, strength or energy projection or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I remember being like, oh, we should make a game out of this. Like, not even realizing there actually already was a Marvel game in existence yeah. <laughs> that I could have gotten bought. So I, like... Tr made up uh, dice mechanics for for that, so it was like if you have a one in something, it's a d4, and if you have a two, it's a d6, and th you know all the way up to like a d20 or something, and we would just battle like we'd, we'd roll, whoever rolls highest wins. <laughs> right? Like uh, depending on what you're doing, you roll a different stat, and uh, we would just battle uh, with that game. I remember like I wrote it in binder paper and like by hand and like colored the front cover and stuff and I named it the Marvel game. That was the first game I ever designed. <laughs> um, given what you mentioned about a 1 being a d4 and 2 being a d d6 all the way up to d20, yeah. um, mm -hmm. I can't, there's a part of me that would have loved to be a fly on the wall when you first found out about Savage Worlds. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. I if I would have thought of it back then and published it back then, you know, that would have been something. Although, I, I, I do remember getting Savage Worlds, like, when it first came out, and I, I still... It, it's a, it is a well-designed game. Mm -hmm. I still have the... I still have the book, and I, I've bought several books for it since, like the Flash I, the Flash Gordon um, set that they put out. I, and I think I also got Savage Rifts. I'm like, yay, Rifts, that's 
in a playable <laughs> playable game. Yeah, I, I know. I know. Before we went live, I mentioned Rifts being my whipping boy. I do. I do want to make clear that Savage Rifts. Um, I put off in a little bubble and I move that off to the corner. So anytime I'm dunking on Rifts, it has nothing to do with that one because it's in its bubble. Yeah, I I was hugely into Rifts though, like in the '90s. I remember like we we got all into into the MDC and all all this stuff and the Vampire Nations and everything like like we we were that and White Wolf games in the '90s. I was really into Rifts and White Wolf mm -hmm. stuff. Oh, but I still play White Wolf on occasion. I I haven't played Rifts in you know 30 years so. I love the set. I always love the setting of Rifts, but the pr the presentation of the books and the p and the Palladium system have have been my whipping boy. Um, the Savage the, the Savage Worlds one looks pretty decent. I would give. I I would, you know, if 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 I ever had the opportunity to play it, I would. But yeah. I, I just said sadly I bought it and n never got to do anything with it. Um, it's <laughs> also the reason I was I was glad to see a Macross game outside outside of um, the Palladium mm. Stranglehold. And I, mm. especially especially since well I know I know that for a while Harmony Gold was holding out hope that they would be able to do that live action Robotech movie but um then the right then the director jumped ship and the writer went on to do the Kingsman sequel oh so <laughs> they pretty they pretty much yeah. have an, they pretty much have an idea but they don't have a, they don't have anybody who can do, who can do the script Oh man! Oh, because oh, well. anytime they get somebody to do, anytime they get somebody to do it, they end up jumping ship to other projects. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's the reason why, af why after so many years, they decided to play. Ni they decided to play nice and just let the original Macross out and in out into the wild again. Mm. Because, yeah. because they re because I think they realized the writing on the wall that th that. The window to try and to try and get to try and get the movie made is sh is slamming shut. Plus, well, they're, well, they're they're a little gam they're a little gambit to try and to try and pick a fight with the BattleTech video games that that were coming that one was out and one was coming out, the Hairbrain mm -hmm. game and um, the MechWarrior Online game, um, that blew up in their face. <laughs> so they didn't have a whole lot of options. Yeah. They call it development hell for a reason. Yeah, oh, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure if I, I'm pretty sure if I dig enough, I will find a tabletop game that suffered through development hell, but I, but I haven't yet, and I think, I think it's largely because the, largely because it's, it would be kind of hard to do it on the same level, like, yeah, if when I think of development hell, I think of stuff like say movie. TV Heaven Heaven's Gate is is a big example. Oh. Mm, was that in development hell, or did it just ha was the production just uh, a super expensive and, uh, the movie flop? Because um, well, development hell is like when there like someone has a screenplay and Hollywood's interested, and this one studio buys it. <laughs> And they, but then they can't get a director. Or they have a director, and they're starting to cast. And then the director died, and so they had to get a new director. And then this other studio bought the project, and it, it, this goes on for like ten years. Uh -oh. Meanwhile, the thing never gets made. The main actor that they would have cast in the role, who would have been like perfect for it, has aged out of the part, and like you, that's development yeah. hell. Is like what I usually think of. I think, yeah, th yeah, there is definitely a line between development hell and. Um... Hell, hell, <laughs> like, <laughs> and in that in that regard, I could probably br I could probably bring up um, the Spider Man musical. Oh, <laughs> the musical that w that once again show once again showed that um, Bono is a piece of shit. Carrie the musical, uh, supposedly Stephen King thought was pretty good. Um, well. Think can't think about the time that he said that, and the fact that that during that time King was coked out of his mind. 
<laughs> That's probably true. Like he's he's outright admitted that he that he was doing way too that he was doing way too much coke during the production of Maximum Overdrive. So if he if he said mm -hmm. that he liked the Carrie musical, take that with a big mm -hmm. grain of salt because. The th mm -hmm. the thing that will that I'll always remember with that was was well let me let me put things in perspective. <laughs> mm -hmm. You have a couple of producers who are from the UK and have never stepped foot in an American high school. Mm -hmm. the 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 director tells that the director tells them think Greece. Now, when you hear that. What do you suppose the what do you suppose the director had in mind when he says think Greece? The nineteen fifties, the pink ladies and the T birds and all that. That is a natural conclusion to make. Yes. Yes. And if you and you can probably tell from my tone, <laughs> that's not what happened. Because... Oh, you mean he thought south of Macedonia? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something that I would do to be a smart ass. <laughs> Not something that should be. T I do remember when I read that part, I legitimately did a spit take because that is something <laughs> I would do as a joke. And yeah, <laughs> they so so they have a set with Roman co with Roman columns and kids in togas on roller skates. Jeez. <laughs> And it's just, these. This is these, that is one of those only in only in production kind of kind of moments where you'd have to ask if somebody is that stupid. But then again, I've ha <laughs> I've had way too many military stories relayed to me of people being just as, if not more, stupid. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. you're gonna be in a shop. You don't you don't need a you don't need a grenade launcher. Then a week later, they give him a belt-fed machine gun. Mm-hmm. Try and figure that one out, <laughs> but yeah. Now, honor and, in and intrigue is obviously mm -hmm. built off of the off the D six approach of um, Barbarians of Lemuria, which eventually eventually a, a name is gonna have to come up is gonna have to be come up with for that system because I have I have way too I have too many setting hacks to, ju to just put it under Barbarians of Lemuria because there's this, there's yeah. e there's Every When, there's the recent Dicey Tales. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh -huh. But how did how, but what prompted what gave you the idea to do, on, to do Honor and Intrigue? Alright, so Honor and Intrigue started out as its own game, right? Like, I started out as my, it's, its own game system and um, I really, I, I, and originally I had like a skill set, a, sk a regular skill system in this game. A lot of the stuff that's in there now, though, as far as terms of like the names of the stats are the same, the the dueling system was the same, and stuff like a lot of stuff is the same as the original version. Um, but it had a pretty complicated skill system, and I wasn't very happy with the skill system that I had for it. And just I was meant I was gonna play test it, and I'm like you know what I'm gonna try it just using the B O L career system as the instead of skills, and it sang right when I ran the play test like I'm like oh man this worked way better than I expected, so I contacted Simon about uh, Simon Washburn about oh could I maybe use this for doing a uh, swashbuckling game and he said you know I've been thinking about doing a like just a, has just as BOL is for like a Conan esque type setting. I was thinking of doing a um, Solomon Kane type thing as well. Uh, would you like to work with me on it? And I said sure. And that we uh, were comparing notes and stuff, and we were working. We worked on it together at first, and uh, he had. I think it was. I think he had another project that he needed to devote more time to, and he told me to just go ahead and run with it. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how it went. So I ended up writing that myself, and um, uh, using the basically using the framework of the, the mechanics. So roll two d six, try to get a nine or better, right? And roll an extra die if you are having 
having some kind of boon or roll a penalty die if you're having some kind of flaw come into play, and that that was the gist. Uh, but a lot of the other things, like the fortune points, the dueling system, uh, that was stuff that I had already put together previously that I kind of uh, figured out how to work that within, uh, use the BOL mechanics to resolve it. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in, with that in mind, was it was it a case where at at some point you began to re you began to realize that this is feeling less like a Lemuria hack and more like it's oh, more like its own thing? Oh, it was definitely intended to be its own mm -hmm. thing, right? Like it was, it, the, it was, it was meant to be its own game, yeah. for, like a standalone game from the start. And so, it now with, and mechanically, it has. I mean, it has a different action economy than BOL yeah. does. I mean, BOL. BOL, you get one action around, and you do your action, and then you're you're, you're done. Mm -hmm. Honor and intrigue has. You has a major. Every hero and villain has a major and a minor action every round, which means that you can do your cool little fencing moves of not, not just do oh I swing and I hit him. It's like I, I, I faint first and then I try to hit him, or I'll do a um, I sho shove this guy over or something before I try to stab him or whatever. Um, so there, there's a different action economy. There's parrying and stuff is assumed as as a thing that you can do. You can act when it's outside of your turn. You can um, uh, split actions and take basically. Uh, you you could essentially take four actions in a round if you really want to. If you want to take the penalty on everything that you're doing, um, so action economy is a bit different in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, with with that in, with that in mind. I suppose I suppose one of the big th one of the big things to ask because I have to I have to do a bit of catch up before I can even d dive into the tome of intriguing options is mm -hmm. what is the what is the what was the appeal of of wanting to do a 17th century that never was well I um I really was into swashbuckling films ever since I was a kid uh, I remember uh, loving the Errol Flynn Robin Hood film, mm -hmm. and uh, ended up my parents buying it for me for Christmas or something that year, and just watching it over and over again, like wore out the VHS tape. <laughs> Watched it so many times. I mean, that, that VHS tape, I had got it in like sixth or seventh grade, and I, I was still watching it when I was like uh, in graduate school. <laughs> still watching it every once in a while. Mm -hmm. But uh, that film. Uh, the original Zorro, the um, uh, but also like the the Richard Lester Three Musketeers was a huge influence. Uh, the the Princess Bride, of course, and also Pirates of the Caribbean was huge at the time mm -hmm. that I was uh, working on this as well. So yeah, oh, I I do remember so insp the inspiration from the genre, just the the genre as a whole was a big. I was a big buff of the the swashbuckling genre. Oh, did you? When it come when it came to when it came to that did you did you end up seeing the du um the duel the duelist yeah. or the duel um the duelist the duel is a is a western uh, from 2016 I had, I had yeah. to make clear and there's also a yeah duelist. the duelists yeah the the one with Harvey Keitel mm -hmm. and um uh, Keith Carradine I think uh, I, uh, I have I have seen it but I hadn't seen it yet when I was writing the game I. Had only been able to watch snippets of it because I, I it was it's hard the the movie was hard to track down. I ended up not getting it because on DVD the DVD was something like fifty dollars. It was ridiculous. Uh, I ended up recently getting it on Amazon. I, I want to say like six or seven years ago I got it, and I finally got to sit and watch the whole movie <laughs> instead of just s scenes from the movie. Like, but I I did watch like a lot of clips from it, like all pretty much the fighting scenes I got to see all of, mm -hmm. but the whole con movie in its own context. But yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, and um, I th the big re I do find it interesting that you, that um, that was a genre that you that you leaned into because one per one particular issue I've had with how a lot of with how a lot of um, both gamers and game designers look at combat is a very antiquated take, a very still still rooted in the wargaming scene. And I see. 
Specif specifically, I've met, I've vo I've been very vocal about my annoyance with f with um fighters being treat being treated as Babby's first character because of the li because of the limited options that they are granted ver versus other archetypes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where yeah. and the th and as as somebody who I I cut my teeth in a lot on a lot of a lot of swordsmanship style. Um, f style films, whether it be samurai, whether it be swashbuckling, um, mm -hmm. or or um, or even the um, wush, or even the wuxia materials, and a lot of swordsman films in that approach. Uh huh. And I I had said, you have whole generations who grew up on those who and grew up on those kind of affairs, did not grow up on the his on the fascination with recreating historical battles that was all over the place in the 70s. Right. Right. And naturally some of those people are going to be are going to try and are going to try and get into role playing games and want to replicate those those kind of those kind of battles, those kind of duels. Yeah. And yes. the rule and the rules for for a lot of games don't really mm -hmm. don't really allow that because they treat because they treat a melee attack as the, as this one as this one off thing when you look at all of those materials I mentioned and it's more like a dance than it is <laughs> than it is yeah. a um it is a it is a single action correct, correct. yes um I, I do remember especially having this issue when one of one of my players um was was very much in was was and still is very much into lucha libre and mm -hmm. if you've seen any, if you've seen any match in that in that style, it is very much a dance. Yeah, and that was a lot of the inspiration for Honor and Intrigue's fighting system. Is like I wanted it to look like or feel at least the way it looks in the movies, right? Like in in any swashbuckling film or really any action movie at all, really. Mm -hmm. uh, how often do you see? Two melee fighters, like two a guy with a, each, two guys with swords, walk up to each other, stand adjacent to each other, and take turns hitting each other without moving, over and over again until one of them falls over. I've never seen that in a movie ever once. And but that's like in a lot of RPGs, that's how melee happens. Is two two guys are standing adjacent to each other. Hitting each other as many times as they can until one of them falls over. And in a lot, in a lot of those cases, it is, it is an issue of who has who has more hit points or who has more wounds or or what Correct. have you. Where, yep. Again, you again you look at you look at the source materials that we've been talking about. It is it mm -hmm. is never it is never that kind of case. You have you have a whole lot of people trying to, you have a, you have a cases of people trying to out trying to outwit and outmaneuver more than. Figure out who's got who's got higher numbers. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So one of my things with the whole design, the point of des the, the design was this advantage system, where um, instead of I'm going to stand here and let you hit me, right? Uh, in instead of that, when you get hit with a melee attack, you have the choice of I'm going to take this hit and take the damage. I can attempt to parry it uh, or dodge, uh, but I also have the option to quote yield advantage. And when you yield advantage, that is when you are getting pushed back up the staircase, right? Or you are shoved up against the rails of the ship, or you are pushed up against the table and then you flip over the table as the enemy sword lands right onto the table and just barely misses you and stuff. So it's, you don't get hit, you don't take damage, but you have an advantage track, right? That when it approaches zero, when you get down to having zero advantage, and heroes and villains have three to start typically. When you have zero advantage, your character is defeated and your opponent gets to decide how you're defeated. Right, and so the advantage track at three points and above, your character is on guard, and at two points you're retreating, one point you're scrambling, and like, and then at zero is you're defeated. Mm -hmm. 
right? So the um, it kind of is meant to evoke the movement and stuff that's happening in the combat. So when people yield advantage, I typically, if I'm playing with maps and minis, I like move the two minis around uh, the map, like into the next room or something like that, where the fight, like you see, like the camera is panning. Mm -hmm as they're fighting that's exactly what's happening when someone yields advantage in the fight yeah and eve of course this is i that whole that whole thing of just of just standard exchanges um the mm -hmm. only time it, the only time it can really work is when you have a bunch of moving parts on the on a on a given on a given field but mm -hmm. It also it ultimately means that when it comes to doing a duel, which you're going to see a lot, which you're going to see a lot of with these source materials mentioned, um, mm -hmm. it ends up it ends up getting you ha you have these multiple turns where ever where people are doing the same action over and over, and you remember you remember Einstein's definition of insanity, right? Yes. Yes, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But. <clears throat> Now to to that end with tome of intrigue with tome of intriguing options um mm -hmm. from what i from what i understand it is a collect it is on one hand a collected version of the intriguing options se series but also adds more to it than ju than just the material that was in the four volumes yeah, I mean it's it's so it's the four volumes of intriguing options and the rules mechanics material from the duelist guide right and it's so it's five volumes of material but it, it it builds on that as well so there's additional there's new weapons all right there's new dueling styles there's new um there's uh like new vehicles um new like there the one of the first section of the book deals with new rules options and so i added more of those to to it as well Right, so just about every section of the book has more content that's been added to it. Like the get the science fiction section, uh, blasters and intrigue has new new gadgets, new vehicles. Uh, uh, addition, like I think I have, I mentioned like in the book, uh, blasters and intrigue how to, how to do modern weapons. Uh, like just kind of here's how to convert a blaster into. In, how, here's how to convert a blaster into a submachine gun, and well, this I actually have the stats for the submachine gun in the book, yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to like do any kind of adjustment. You can just look at it from the back of the book. Of course, by the time I get my get a hold of it, I'll probably end up using this as an excuse to make um, exaggerated weapons, uh, exaggerated versions of prototype and rid and ridiculous weapons that were that have been made, just. Just well, that that is a thing you absolutely can do. I, I'm actually in the original Honor and Intrigue book. I have uh, that you can make contraptions like clockwork punk type inventions, and one of the things that you can make is guns with multiple barrels. And these were real things that existed. Uh, so you could make a knock volley gun, which is a musket that has seven barrels. Oh. I had at one point for for a different campaign I had I had done what I a uh, what was essentially a sem imagine a semi-automatic version of a punt gun. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not familiar, a punt gun was used to was this ridiculous um, gun that was used to hunt ducks. It was banned because it was too good at its job, and it. it I like to give my players very powerful but very unsafe, unwieldy, and sometimes weapons that are just as dangerous to the wielder as it is. Oh, <laughs> is it... give them give them a chain blade. And I do have a stat block for, a stats for a chain blade in the Blasters yeah. Entry. Uh, <laughs> for, for what it's worth, this is the most, I'm going to send you the most common image of a punt gun. <laughs> just so you have an idea of what you're dealing with. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> for hunting ducks? What did you What did you do? Displace the water in the entire pond and thus kill all the ducks in it? Yes. Like that doesn't look like it. That looks like it would kill an elephant. Uh, plus, in 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 more modern cases, I'll I'll often reference the Fat Mac, which um is which it which is a single shot rifle that is technically a hunting rifle, 
but it is ridiculous because it is not chambered in a normal round. It's chambered in 950 JDJ, which is like twice as thick, which is bigger than like 30 out six. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. um, let me, s because the th and the. Th and this is this is another case we'll have I'll have to use, I'll have to send you the image because that is because down down at the bottom is the is the thing and yeah I see, I see the chain blade I'm pr um <laughs> that is I can th I can think of plenty I can think of plenty of folk who will who will use that um I'm pretty sure somebody would talk me into putting it on their arm. <laughs> Actually, there you can do that in the game. Uh, in in the blasters and intrigue section, uh, there is cybernetics that you can attach to your character. It, it works the same as any other gadget. And one of the gadgetry cybernetics you can have is hidden. One of them is a hidden weapon in your arm. The other is just like to have a weapon for an arm. And so there's no reason you can't have a chain blade for an arm. You you totally could. That gun was uh, quite large as well, not as big as the punt gun. <laughs> yeah, it's I, some some people might some people might look at that and say that that's excessive. But if you're hunting if you're hunting like say a rhino or an elephant, you'd need something with that kind of power because you need it. You need to make sure that it actually stops where it's supposed to and not stop slide and not run running you over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but but ev even with that, I've. I've frequently referenced the noisy cricket from Men in Black as an example yeah. of what I mean yeah. by powerful but unsafe. Yes. Yes. You know, because it's it's gonna punch a hole in just about anything, but you're also gonna get knocked twenty yards. Yeah. Like, yeah, like there's like there are standard like air quotes standard types of blasters and such weapons that you can equip that don't don't really count as special equipment and then there's stuff that you have to buy with a boon uh, called like magnificent arms and so the magnificent arms like some of them are a bit like that where it's like yeah this is this does a lot more damage at, at the potential cost of being more lethal or, uh, there's also the the one of the things in the blasters and intrigue section of the book is i talk about other science fiction genres besides uh space opera mm -hmm. And one of them, the one of them that actually gets like its own like section is, instead of like a side part part is steampunk, and it one of the things that it has is that weapons have so, not just weapons, but any kind of tech can backfire. Like so, sometimes you're you're it, you, there's like a list of potential flaws in the gadget mm -hmm. that it can have, and the, it backfiring on you is is one of them. Yeah, because. Everybody likes the archetype of some of the ma the mad inventor who makes stuff that works, mostly, mm -hmm. with an asterisk. Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. And there's and there's always there's always been there's always been plenty of um of ca of cases of are you sh are you sure this is gonna work? Nope, I have no clue. Yeah. I have no clue, which is. In in all and in all in all fairness, we have some of that in the real world. If you if you ask anybody who's dipped who's dipped into programming and and still has some measure of sanity, yeah, like somebody I do know a few programmers. Like <laughs> the program the program doesn't work. I have no idea why this isn't working. The program works. I have no idea why it's working. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't do anything different. All I did was turn it off and back on again. Uh, oh. God, I, I got so sick of hearing that. Oh, uh, that I was I was a in one of my jobs I was a I was across from where from tech support and I would hear and if I did a drinking game out of the number of times I heard, have you tried turning it off and turning it on again? I'd probably be dead. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a TV show called The IT Crowd oh, where I, that that's like they say, they say it multiple times an episode. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, but I I will I will admit when I ended up going through the duelist guide and seeing the different types, um, a small part of me ended up rant ended up ranting once again about how um, Italian swords are witchcraft. 
because mm. they have the Italians have the have this weird ass approach to to handles. Even even mm. nowadays, when it comes to fencing weapons, it's it's the it's that weird ring thing that I can never figure out. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like the Quillian, is that what it's called? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> but the when I can now, I will, I will also, I will also note, I did get a, I did get a kick out of you referencing the Hassar with some, the winged Hassars with some of the art. Oh yeah. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there the the wing to there is actually a wing to a in a campaign that I played that I or I ran I, I ran a campaign that lasted about a year and a half and uh, one one of the players played a wing to a mm -hmm. and I have used that same image as a pregen when I've run the game at conventions and you'd be surprised how many people pick that one like uh, the wing to a is a pretty popular choice for some reason yeah. I think it's just because he looks so interesting <laughs> he's like got like a what like a leopard skin cape and wings on he's wearing plate mail that's a kind of an interesting look to him now in when it came to blasters and intrigue you did you uh -huh. did end up inputting um dog fighting rules and that's mm -hmm. one that's one of those things that um plenty plenty of people end up o end up overlooking but for for yeah. What was what was the what was the approach that you that you decided to take in order to kind of replicate dogfighting within your system? Was it a relatively easy thing to do, or was it a bit tricky at first? It was a bit easy to do in the sense that I knew that I wanted it to work similar to how the dueling rules work for the hand-to-hand -hand sword fights. Uh, that I wanted it to be an advantage-based system where, okay, you yield advantage, right? Uh, what I did different, though, is, and, like, at, at first I was thinking of doing it this way, and I'm like, I abandoned the concept, is... And in the hand-to-hand -hand combat for Honor and Intrigue, there's a list of maneuvers. There's major actions and minor actions, and there's a bunch of different maneuvers uh, in, in each one. Right, so bind is a specific maneuver that you use to like trap your enemy's sword. Right, uh, faint is a specific maneuver that if you succeed at it, you get a bonus die to hit with your next attack, and so on. I didn't want to have a list of specified maneuvers with dogfighting, so what I ended up doing is when you yield advantage, right, and I I, I changed it so that. Instead of there's advantage and then there's pilot advantage, right? And pilot advantage is based on your character's rank in the the pilot career, right? There's a boon you can take born in the cockpit that will raise your maximum pilot advantage as well. But um, essentially, the assumption is if you're playing in a space faring type campaign, if a character has zero ranks in pilot, they get two. Like they get two points in pilot advantage because it's like piloting a starship there is as common as driving a car for us, mm -hmm. right? Like Princess Leia can fly a starship, no problem, even though she's not an official pilot, right? Mm -hmm. um, same, goes, same goes for this. Uh, now with, and then if you have a, if your character has the pilot career, you, you get an advantage of three. And if your rank is higher than that, it's equal to your rank. And if you have born in the cockpit, you get one higher. Mm -hmm. uh, yielding advantage in in a in a uh, starship, or sorry, I should say starfighter, uh, means that your opponent gets to place a condition on your ship, right? And depending on what kind of condition it is, it might affect you in different ways. So one type of condition that could be placed on you is that you're caught in a spin. All right, so I just barely managed to avoid that hit. I turned, I turned hard. Uh, I banked left real hard, and now I'm, my ship is caught in a spin, and I'm going to need to correct myself out of it. So that means before you can attack again, you have to make a check. All right, and the GM will tell you what the check needs to be to pull yourself out of the spin. Right, so in this case, I might say, "All right, you got to get control of the stick, so it's going to be a might check. Add pilot to might, and if you su get a, you succeed, then you pull out of the spin, right?" And um, 
the difficulty of getting out of, of uh, one of these things is based on how many of these conditions you have, how much, con how much pilot advantage you've yielded already mm -hmm. uh, in the fight. Right. So, uh, and there's all sorts of different types of conditions you can place, and there's also different types of effects that these conditions can have. So, like, one is, oh, they blasted your weapon. They didn't hit your, you know, the part of your ship that's going, is really controlling its structural integrity, but for whatever reason, either they hit your targeting sensor or you just can't get a lock on them because of, of how they're, they're flying, you're unable to attack, right? So you, I yielded a pilot advantage, but now I can't attack. Maybe I can't see the enemy, or, or maybe it's something happened to my weapon system, but I can't attack, right? Another possibility would be um, uh, you can you you um, you have to take a penalty die in your next pilot check or something, uh, or. I may, barely managed to miss this asteroid that I you, uh, I swerved and got out of the way of your blaster fire, but this asteroid like scratched the paint on the side of my vehicle, and the vehicle takes a D3 of damage. Now it's way better than the 2D6 or whatever you'd take from the blaster shot, but it's it's not nothing, right? That you're going to take a little bit of damage, mm -hmm. uh, or one of the ships like oh he hit one of my engines, so I lost a point off of my ship's engines. Mm -hmm. Right, um, or it's like, oh, I, uh, I, I, I got a second guy to come up on on your tail, and so now I'm going to give him a bonus to hit, right? Like, so other people get a bonus to hit you, mm -hmm. right? So there's all kinds of like little extra bonuses and penalties that can be applied with the pilot advantage. Yeah. It's more free, form, right? It, the the big difference between it and the official dueling rules is it's meant to be more freeform than the regular dueling rules, although it still has, like, these are the conditions that you can put on them, and these are the kind of explanations of why these conditions are applied. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And with that, and with that in with that in mind, do you suppose that it wouldn't it wouldn't take too much work to um ha to hack the dogfighting rules so that instead of instead of dealing with starfighters, it's say a it's a it's a, a more more of a racing affair. Um, you mean like if you want to run a race? Yes. Like just ru run a, a race between ships. Yeah. I mean. You could use the dogfighting rules to do that, or you could use the chase scene mm -hmm. rules for that too. Both both would work. Uh, I suppose it would depend on what type of race it is, right? If it's if it's like some kind of uh, Ben Hur slash Mad Max type race, I would probably go with the dogfighting rules. And if it's but if it's going to be like um, more, more like just who can move the fa the furthest, the fastest. I'd probably use the chase sequence, mm -hmm. but you can dramatically they they're both to accomplish the same yeah. effect. Now, when it comes to when it came to the spells and spellcasters part, um, mm -hmm. with that with that one, because uh, there's obviously a whole lot of ver of um potential that can be done. When introducing a magic system into a world, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. how how did you make sure to refine the net so that it's not too big to the point where you have the spell bloat that some fantasy games suffer from? Yeah. So one thing is that so Honor and Intrigue originally had a magic system that was somewhat similar to the one from BOL, which is that there's magic called Dark Sorcery, only evil villains can use it. If you use it, your character is automatically an evil villain. And the other, the magic that's available to the heroes is alchemy, fortune telling, uh, soothsaying, like that kind of stuff, like hermet, the hermetic arts, mm -hmm. right? Or making talismans, right? Like, I make a medallion that'll keep me from getting sick, right? Which, there's no way to know it, IRL if that actually works or not, right? <laughs> Like, is, is he not getting sick because of his medallion, or is he not getting sick just because he didn't get sick, right? But so, the, the, that was the magic system that I was building off of. And what I did is, at first I was going to just uh, base it off of the, the s system that was done for the evil sorcerers. And the one thing is that the power scale there 
is different, right? Like, spell, so their spells go up to the third circle, so third level is like your highest level spell, right? And it, for dark sorcerers, a third level spell can be like, I cause a plague that kills an entire town, or I raise a ship of the damned from the bottom of the ocean, right? That is some crazy high power level stuff, mm -hmm. right? And it and part of the one of the things that makes that magic rare and dangerous is things like oh, but to make the spell work, I also had to cast it during a blood moon and cut off my own left arm, right? So there's uh, there's like a serious dangerous cost to the magic, and the magic is also crazy, insanely powerful. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do is tone down the scale, right? So a third level spell in uh, Honor and Intrigue, or sorry, with uh, the Tome of Intriguing Options, a third level spell is still going to be pretty powerful. Like, you can you can bestow permanent sentience on, like, a coat rack if you really want to, right? You can, you can enchant, you can enchant, or you can make a tree able to walk and talk and stuff like that but um, the the in, the cost level isn't going to be the same right the scale of what you can do isn't quite as severe right for for that so uh, as far as like third level spells I'm, I have the first level open right mm -hmm. so putting a gaius on someone right like saying uh, you will get as long as you don't reveal your true name to a stranger, uh, you, you're going to be, you know, a, a better adventurer, right? Like you, you essentially, your character is has like is kind of blessed until you break the the terms of the Gaius, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or uh, just a really high level healing spell would be a, a third level spell, like oh, I can. Uh, my this I can restore someone's like lost hand, right? You can make it grow back, mm -hmm. or uh, true invisibility, right? That's that's a third level spell. Yeah, uh, being able to turn into an animal is a third level spell. So like, there's a first level spell. It's like I can get the claws of an animal, mm -hmm. right? Like I can get like wolf claws, or I can get or tiger claws, or I can get like a poisonous bite as a first level spell, but the third level one is I can turn into an alligator or something like that would be like a third level spell. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, things that have like a really long duration or I think one of them is called nigh invincibility or near invincibility and that spell makes it so that you can um Basically, you get a permanent. You get while the spell is on, you have this da serious damage reduction that uh, you can't. You you can get hurt, but they have to hit hit you really hard to hurt you. It's like it's like it's like you're made out of like rock, or you have a force field around your skin, or something like that that keeps you from getting hurt. But some of those spells, like the higher higher power ones, also have a cost, but instead of the cost being, oh, and I have to, like, sacrifice cutting off my left hand to make the spell work, it's something like at the end of the spell's effect you lose a point of composure and you lose a point of advantage as your character is suddenly very fatigued. Mm -hmm. Right? So, it, it depends on the spell. Most of them don't do that, but the near invincibility one and the lightning, I think the lightning reflex one does that. One that makes it so you move super fast. Uh, also is very draining. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as scale goes, those are all very powerful effects, but they're not raising a ship of the damned off the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> right? Or or causing a huge plague to like sweep through a town killing thousands of people. It's mm -hmm. it's going to be like, I do a fireball that might kill like a dozen enemies if they're all standing in a group. Yeah. Right? So and the scale, the, the cost isn't as severe either. It's like the third level spells for the um, dark sorcery type magic is I think nine arcane power to cast, which you can reduce with things, with other things in the book. But uh, for a, a third level spell uh, to cast for a um, a wizard or a paladin or a 
psionicist, right, is only six mm-hmm. arcane power. So it's it's not as uh, severe of a cost mm-hmm. uh, to pay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now, given given that one, so the, the the first level spells start off about the same. It's it's like the the but the the scale like the the bell curve is or. or it's not really a bell curve, but the curve is is a little bit more in between, mm-hmm. as far as like how strong it is. Yeah, and when it comes to now, when it came to int- when it came to introducing non-human characters, since mm-hmm. from the one of the big one of the big things that that I that I always tried I always try to avoid is. Making making it so that the not, so that humans don't feel don't feel like the third wheel when you're introducing non-humans, you know, because ah, yes. because of all the features that can that can be granted. Um, yes, I'm guessing I'm guessing that the that the approach that you had was to was to make sure that um, humans don't end up on the ba- on the back foot, and so you have a bunch of people in a bunch of different races oh, all at once. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so humans do have one serious advantage in the game, and that is that. So in the regular on an intrigue, every character gets a boon for free, and if they want a second boon, they have to take a flaw. Mm-hmm. And if they want a third boon, they have to take at least two flaws. Uh, non-humans don't get a free flaw. That's so. That's humans. The special ability of humans is they get a boon for free. The I I said flaw. I said should have said boon. So humans get a boon for free. Uh, everything else has to get a um, has to take a flaw for every boon that they take. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, now non-humans are allowed to have more than three because they have their own list of ones that are unique to them. Uh, so it's kind of like there's a, like a little list of um, ones that ones that go for each uh, species, right? So uh, let's pick uh, one bird kid, all right? So bird people, all right? It's like these can either be anthropomorphic humans with wings like the Hawkmen from Flash Gordon, or it can actually be avian humanoids, uh, depending on your campaign and what you want to do. And they all have wings, all right. So they, they, there's a list of boons and flaws for birdkin boons and birdkin flaws. There's an asterisk next to the wing one. That means that you have to take this one. Mm-hmm. It's an intrinsic trait that all birdkin have is they all have wings, right? And so, but you can choose. The rest of the boons are your your choice. So you could take. Beast friend, which is like I have a fr- a friend who's a, a pet falcon or something that follows me around. Beguiling, I have a higher flare score than most people. Mm-hmm. Claws and bite, I have big talons and a giant beak, and I can peck people with it. Right, this would obviously not be for the the anthropomorph the, the not for the hawkmen from Flash Gordon, mm-hmm. but if you're doing an anthropomorphic bird. Uh, eagle eyes, all right? Your eyes can see like a telescope. Um, weapon of choice, like the sabers and pistols, for some reason, they seem to favor them, I guess, because they're lighter weapons. All right? And then there's the birdkin flaws. Atypical body. Mm-hmm. Basically, atypical body is a flaw that a lot of the species have that's intrinsic, that is, there's something that you your phys- physiology makes it that you can't do or can't wear. So... The bird can have to if they're going to wear like some kind of armor, it has to be specially made for them to wear it because of the wings, mm-hmm. right? Uh, if you if you're one of the types of birdkin that have like talons, right, you're not going to be wearing boots, right? Like boots made for humans and things like that. And so that's a requirement, and the wings is a requirement. So those two pay for themselves, but. If you want to take the other ones, like absent mind, like uh, bird can have a tendency to be absent-minded or arrogant or delicate. Basically, having hollow bones is good for flying, not so good for getting hit with a mace, mm-hmm. right? Uh, or phobia, right? Claustrophobia being a big problem with 
if you if you're used to being out in the open sky being held in a small little cage or something could be much more devastating to you right? but you have a choice right so if you're playing a birdkin you the, you don't have like all birdkin have to have this exact set of characteristics you can have you have your wings you have your atypical body flaw but other than that you get to pick mm -hmm. right and a lot of them have no no requires things at all right like if we go to like elf right mm -hmm. elf has just a list of elven boons and a list of elven flaws but none of them are required right so no two elves are necessarily going to be the same yeah uh it's 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 so you have some degree of choice there with how your your personal elf is right because these aren't requirements they're tendencies within mm -hmm. the species yeah now with with all that with all that in with all that in mind um mm -hmm. one one particular one particular thing i was i was curious about is with um as you mentioned as mentioned with ru with um with rules and sto with rules and story it's also including material from the duelist guide um yes what what was the reason to com to combine the two well, they're not technically combined. Uh, the, so the Duelist Guide is its own section of, of the book. Mm -hmm. So section one is Rules and Story. Section two is the Duelist Guide. Section three is Blasters and Intrigue. Four is non-human characters. And five is um, Spells and Spellcasters. So the Duelist Guide still has its own section in the book. Uh, but some of, the, some of the material that was in the Duelist Guide got moved to... Uh, rules and story, and that's because it was more rules. The the part that was more general rules got moved to rules and story. So, for example, one of the things that got moved from Duelist Guide section to the rules and story section is a rule for specific injuries. Right, like you could choose uh, to have your character take a permanent wound of like getting their hand cut off. Right, like so, your guy. Let's say you're playing blasters and intrigue mm -hmm. and you're having a duel on the side of some scaffolding under under a city let's say it's a, a city in the clouds for whatever reason and you're having a duel with your laser swords and you get your hand you, 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 the guy hits you your opponent hits you and he hits you for like something like 10 damage you have eight hit points left <laughs> right? you, have, you have eight health the hit points in this game are called lifeblood you have eight lifeblood now you could choose, all right, I'm defeated, right? Like, let's say you were down to your last point of advantage, you had eight, eight lifeblood left, and he just hits you for 10 damage. Mm -hmm. And you're standing on this narrow scaffolding so that if your character is knocked out, you're going to die, <laughs> right? So you could choose, you know what? I'm not going to yield advantage, so you're not going to defeat me. I'm not going to take the damage because... I, I I don't want my character to die. So instead, you get my hand, right? So what you can what the non-lethal or sorry, I said non-lethal. It's uh, the um, section on uh, lasting injuries, right? Uh, lets you uh, say, all right, I lost my hand. All right, I reduce the damage. All right, I take the hit. I'm going to reduce the damage by ten. But now my character permanently has the missing limb flaw. Mm -hmm. But uh, also, kind of to make it not so bad, I also got three extra fortune points for doing that to myself. Yeah. So, and that way, later on, I can, like, hear, maybe I have some telepathy with someone that tells me, I'm coming to rescue you. <laughs> hang on at the bottom of that, uh, hang on to the bottom of that uh, space station. We'll be along in any, any minute. Mm -hmm. You know? So... Yeah, so that, that that section got moved to the rules section, though, because it's more rules-focused than anything to do with the dueling style. So the the stuff in the Duelist Guide section of the book is the stuff that's specifically related specifically to dueling. So it's mostly dueling styles. There is a little bit about additional maneuvers that is included there. So uh, the core the core rule book, uh, there's like one... I think maybe two maneuvers 
that were added, right? So, uh, all right. There, so there's a repartee that was added called goading, and so it's, it's instead of intimidation or taunting, it, goading is like trying to dare someone to attack you, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Horsemanship was added. Uh, I guess that, I guess about four or five maneuvers were added. Forfend maneuver. So it's basically I predict what you're going to do, and use it against you. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, quick mount. The one that is new to this book that I that I just added was quick mount or quick dismount, which all it is is it works like um, quick drawing a weapon, but instead of drawing a weapon, you're getting onto or off of a horse. Right? Study opponent. Mm -hmm. Right. So those. There's like five-ish maneuvers that were added, and then the rest is dueling styles. And there's ten dueling styles that I added to since since uh, the original Duelist Guide. There's ten more dueling styles that have been added to this. Yeah. So. Now, in a lot of science fiction... It's like 46. <laughs> there's 46 <laughs> dueling styles. In a lot of science fiction settings, you do have mm -hmm. oh, the character archetype that does have some sort of extra-normal... Um, ability. Yes. yes. Whether, whether the in, like obviously, obviously you have force use in Star Wars. You have the psychic abilities in with several races in Trek, but in particular the Vulcans. You have, um, you have you have like biotics in math in Mass Effect, and so mm -hmm. on and. If so, if someone want if someone wanted to have have their own equivalent to that, yep. Oh, yep. But it but it doesn't but it doesn't quite fit it doesn't quite fit the the idea of magic. Yep. Um, how would how would you tackle that given the tool set that's av that's available through the, through the books? So the book actually handles it as a type of spellcaster, mm -hmm. right? So when you t there's a career in the game called spellcaster, mm -hmm. and when you take spell the spellcaster career, you the player define what it is, and so that replaces the word spellcaster in the name, or or I usually just put it in a parentheses next to spellcaster. Mm -hmm. So in th this case, you would do telepath or psionicist, right, uh, for your spellcaster type, and. One of the things that it talks about is, for one, every spellcaster type has a suggested list of what powers are fitting for that type of spellcaster, right? So there's a, a list, a set list of things that are suggested for a psionicist or a telepath to take. Uh, but then the set, the book also suggests on uh, has a, a little side in that section called psionics and game balance, and it's essentially well, why should the GM allow someone to basically cast spells without having to wave their hands or say any magic words? Because that's kind of a a downside of being a spellcaster is that, oh, you have to be able to speak and use your hands to use your magic. And But if I'm a psionicist, all I have to do is think about it and the, the effect manifests. Why is that fair? right? So I have a little section, side section on there about that. And how it balances, for example, uh, psionics can't enchant objects. They can't. Um, they can't benefit from having a wand or anything like that. Uh, at least not as getting a casting bonus or anything. Um, so there, there's like a list on how to balance it. But in essence, psionics are a type of spellcaster, and they just refer to their powers as, or to, as their, their abilities instead of calling them spells, they call them talents or, or powers or whatever rather than calling them that. that. Uh, the game also addresses some stuff like that you would, ha how you would adapt things for like a, say a space opera level campaign mm -hmm. uh, where uh, there's, there's a little side section called spells in space. And um that section um, uh, it, it talks about things like how, uh, well, in the movies you can see someone choke someone out from a view screen, like they, they can be psychically choking someone on a view screen when that person's mi thousands of miles away or something. Uh, but the range on the range on uh, the 
the da that damage spell in the game is not nearly that far, so how does it work? Or I can see e the game, the, the, the telekinesis spell only can lift like hundreds of pounds. How can you stop someone's starship from taking off out of the docking bay? And so what it talks about is that you can at times do what's called dramatic scale effects. Or maybe, I, or maybe it was epic scale. Uh, I, I can't, I can't have, I don't have the page open right in front of me. But um, if you're having these epic scale type events happen, uh, essentially the G, if it's happening to the players, if like the GM is like, okay, your ship can't take off because the guy is sitting on the platform and uh, he's telekinesing the ship to keep it from taking off, the GM gives you a fortune point mm -hmm. for doing that to you, right? Uh, but uh, the player can choose to do it as well, and they can pay, I think, fortune and uh, X. They have to have like an X. The, the casting cost goes up, the difficulty to cast the spell is increased, but they can have essentially the intensity of the effect is dramatically increased. Mm -hmm. And so that, that makes it possible to do things like I'm going to la raise my starship out of the water so that we can get back to that cloud planet. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with given the given the numerous um st given the numerous fencing styles and my love of the mm -hmm. lightsaber forms that were in Star Wars that was one of the things that brought me mm -hmm. back in brought me back into the proverbial fold um mm -hmm. I would there's a part of me that would be curious how how an how an equivalent of some of the forms might be uh, might be might be approached in an equivalent manner Within, on, within ah. honor and intrigue. There's a couple of ways you could do it. One is you could do it just as an existing dueling style. You could take a, you, you could either do it as a du regular dueling style, where you approach. Um, all right, think about what maneuvers this style would favor and give it that. Like, and the the duelist guide goes over in more detail on how to create dueling styles. But the gist is, pick five maneuvers. Pick a pick a benefit that you get for being like proficient in the style, and then pick a benefit you get for mastering the style, mm -hmm. right? And so once you figured that out, you have a dueling style. They're they're relatively quick to create. Uh, but let's say you want to incorporate the use of the force or some or magic or whatever into your fighting style that you make. That one of the additional things that is in the spells and spellcaster section is called sword casting styles. And that that basically is, you have three fighting maneuvers and two spells that you ha you need to know and use to use these effects. And typically, uh, a, a sword casting style enhances the effect of the spell in question. So let's take for example, uh, the first the first sword casting style is called Agile Blade, right? And this, if you could imagine, like, like a, a Jedi, mm -hmm. right, who's focused on defense, right? So Jedi, Jedi who focuses on defense, and uh, Agile Blade uses a broadsword wielded in two hands. Mm -hmm. Now, energy blades in the game are they function the same as the equivalent sword, but they do two extra points of damage. And they do a hell of a lot more damage when you're attacking like an inanimate object. So if you're trying to like cut through the bulkhead, they do like ridiculous amounts of damage, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they also, if 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 anyone tries to parry an energy blade with something that isn't an energy blade or an electric staff or electro staff or as an energy shield, uh, you get a free chance to break their weapon. Right? Mm -hmm. But anyway, any sword can be an energy. So you have an energy blade broadsword. The maneuvers that this style uses, Agile Blade, is glide, dodge, and footwork, right? And then the spells bolster defense and fleet of foot. Now, a psionicist could be able to... You could do this with a psionicist-type character just as well as you could do it with a wizard, right? Depending on what the campaign setting is. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do it, this is in the far future... We have psionicists using energy blades, all right? It's the a psionic that's doing it. If we're doing it in the Forgotten Realms type setting, then we'll have it be a wizard, mm -hmm. right? It's it's up to the up to the GM and the milieu of the setting that they want to do. But they pick these maneuvers and spells, and then uh, the special ability, whirling offense, split your action to make 
two blade work attacks using a broadsword gripped in two hands while under the effects of the fleet of foot spell. So you have to use that fleet of foot spell, but you can now do two attacks with one weapon, which normally in the game to split your action you have to use a weapon in each hand. Right? So this makes it so you could do two attacks uh, that way. And then the last secret is hold your hold the high ground. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when wielding a broadsword in a, a two-handed grip, you get an energy die, uh, sorry, a bonus die to parry while under the effect of the bolster defense spell. So in other words, you are really hard to hit um, when you're using, using the broadsword in a two-handed two grip. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's, that's one potential uh, fighting style that I think might lend itself well to a lightsaber. Uh, type weapon. Now, if you want to do like the uh, whip, like a, a light whip, right? There's one called Lash of Flame that's a whip based, uh, like an energy whip based one. But um, there's uh, uh, another one that's focused on offensive use that I think also could lend itself well to using with a lightsaber, and that would be Torrential Storm. This is a broadsword wielded in one hand, and this one is, it uses Bind, Shove, Trip, Blade Throw, and then the spells Damage Bolt and Bolster Offense. And this one, its special benef first benefit is Hurl Death. When you cast Damage Bolt, instead of conjuring bolts of energy that float and shoot an enemy, uh, instead you're throwing your sword mm -hmm. at them, right? Which, if you could imagine someone throwing a lightsaber and then making it come back to their hand, type of a thing, mm -hmm. right? So you can also, when you use, when you hurl your sword with Damage Bolt or use the Blade Throw maneuver, uh, you go a bonus die of damage with it. Now this is the basic ability. Also you can uh, magically um, get your hand, your weapon to fly back to your hand mm -hmm. right after you throw it. Um, and then the last, the final secret of this one is Relentless Assault. While under the effect of your bolster offense spell enemies get a penalty die to parry your broadsword attack. So you could almost picture those two characters fighting each other mm -hmm. uh, as the one, one is the offense focused trying to batter through the enemy's defense, the other one's defense focused, mm -hmm. trying to parry the other one's attacks. Yeah. Right. But, and um, one, there's one other sort, sort of, sort of, I guess, fighting style that I've always been, I've always been curious about it, about adapting into, into various games. And some games have an easier time, and some games have an, have a harder time. Have you ever mm -hmm. seen the film Equilibrium? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. It is. I'm not going to say it's a great film, but it is an interesting one. And mm -hmm. within that is the concept of gun kata, which they dis which is is gun fu in a se in a sense, but the difference mm -hmm. is it is all it is all about being able to predict the pl the placement of the of en of enemies and put yourself in a position where the k that minimizes the kill zone while maximizing mm -hmm. one's own mm -hmm. um usually usually with usually with a pair of pistols yes 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 oh uh, yeah so there are, there are um uh high tech dueling styles mm -hmm. In the game, uh, in the, the, the I, I mentioned I added ten new, brand new ones to this book. Six of those ten are the high tech ones, and um, so if we're talking the high tech dueling styles, uh, there is specifically one that's for wielding a gun in each hand. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the paired pistolier uh, that is. Uh, you have a bla you you have a blaster in each hand, right? Or two modern day pistols would all you can also do this with modern day pistols, mm -hmm. right? And uh, 
essentially if you successfully dodge an opponent's attack, you can repost using a ranged instead of melee if the target was within two range increments of you. So, in other words, if the guy's within 40 feet of you with a blaster or within 20 feet of you with a, regu a, like a regular pistol, uh, but depending on the time period, you might be using a better than regular pistol, right? Uh, but as long as a person's within two range increments of you, you can shoot back if you have your gun ready. So if you picture some, and this is after a successful dodge, so I, the exact thing, you can almost probably picture this, that I was picturing in my mind when I designed that maneuver is diving across the hallway, unloading a gun, unloading two guns as you're diving across the hallway into the next room, mm -hmm. uh, shooting at, at the enemies that are down the end of the hall. And then the last secret is, uh, final secret is deadly barrage brain fire almost like an automatic weapon you can use the concentrated fire sweeping fire and suppressing fire menu uh, abilities with two pistols uh, when doing so you roll damage with a bonus die mm -hmm. so and normally so one of the things in the game is all of those fire modes are reserved normally for a full auto weapon but you can do it even with just two pistols because you're just shooting so many shots down the hallway mm -hmm. right. but uh, there there are a number of other styles that might lend itself to that uh, whole gun fu type of a thing, like the frontline style uh, uses a submachine gun or a repeating rifle or a shotgun or something like that, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it ignores the first the the penalty to hit from hip firing, uh, and you can also throw a grenade easier with that style, like. Uh, instead of a, a minor to arm and a major to throw, you can just throw a arm and throw a grenade as a single mi major action. And then the the final secret for that one is uh, if you get use footwork to move yourself into an advantageous position, you get plus one to your def plus two to your defense or plus two to ranged, mm -hmm. uh, and a bonus die to evade explosions. So uh, I was uh, a lot of the questions of like design and stuff for these advanced weaponry styles was uh, what how this would work in an action movie. Yeah. Right? yeah. Which action is definitely the watchword regar regardless of regardless of genre within this um, approach. Yeah. Now couple, coupling all that together, what would you say the total page count for the Tome of Intriguing Options is going to be? It's 260 um, inside. Um, I'm like not counting the book's cover or anything, but I think uh, with the the post, like the 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 thanks to the backers section, it gets up to two sixty pages. Mm -hmm. And with and with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a not a not not an outright date, but a but a general ballpark. So for PDF, I mean, I have the finished PDF in front of me right now. I've <laughs> been referring to it the, during the conversation. Uh, so the PDF is ready to go. So it's it'll be August 1st is when the Kickstarter ends. I think it will depend on how much time it takes uh, on their end to process all of the pledges and get me the backer info. But it should be like within a week of that, I would hope. Uh, to have that all squared away, mm -hmm. so PDF should be ready. To, like people, people should be getting their PDFs like within a week of the Kickstarter ending. And um, I cur I I think just was it yesterday or the day before? I sent off. Uh, I have also finished uh, the print, uh, the the print proof, mm -hmm. right? So I sent a copy of the print proof to the printers. I haven't heard back from them yet, but it, it is a weekend, right? So uh, I hope to hear back from them. And assuming that they they green light it, uh, that means that we're we're in a good position for getting it into print uh, sometime. Mm -hmm. it, it says September. In the Kickstarter says September, with very good luck, uh, we could. Assuming everything goes pitch perfect according to plan. It, it, the book arrives, the, the proof arrives t in a timely manner, and there is no problem with the proof when the physical proof arrives. It's conceivable that it could be greenlit for August, but I'm not going to, you know, say that 
is like expect the expectation. The hope is the the realistic hope is September. Yeah. Well, first casualty is always the plan. Yes. So it's yes. it's always it's always good yeah. to um, under promise and over deliver in that in that kind of situation, especially with all the that is hell that happens with <laughs> um, printing. I am very very aware of that, but I have. I want, on the one hand, uh, uh, I have gotten better at handling it, and on the other hand, uh, I, I have been getting very good support from the people at Drive Through with my last couple of projects that went to print, uh, and it has it has been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, I, I'm I am optimistic uh, about uh, it going to print, uh, but as I said, yeah, the PDF PDFs are ready. Uh, already, the PDFs are ready for people to to have. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, this this Kickstarter is about getting the book in print. So I'm wait I'm still waiting to hear back. Uh, and basically, if they if they green light it, they tell me okay, it, everything looks in accordance to the parameters that the printer has set. Then at that case, the last thing I have to do, and this also de has to, I have to do this after the pledges are processed, right? Uh, but that's get in the the thanks to the backers section. Uh, it's it's the it, closing credits of the book is going to be the names of the backers mm -hmm. uh, to give them a, a thanks, and that will take probably you know wouldn't even take me a day to do. But I have to the pro the issue will be I'll have to wait until after I get all that information mm -hmm. before before I can uh, finish uh, before I can put it into the book. And then send it out. So that's going to cause probably a little bit of delay. So it's it's not I, I won't be able to get this to backers like the day after the project. I suppose I could do the PDF to backers, you know, without the thanks, and then just give add the thanks, and then give them an update when <laughs> when it's included in the PDF. Mm -hmm. But for the print, I have to wait yeah. uh, for that. Yeah, understand understandable. Well. Mm -hmm. With all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And <laughs> anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!